Good morning, bem-vindo, and welcome to the Palliative Care Friday Chalk Talks. Thank you all for joining us for today's discussion on a new prognostic application for outpatient cancer patients with incurable disease. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our guest, Dr. Carlos Eduardo Paiva, who led this project. Dr. Paiva is a medical oncologist at the Bredos Cancer Hospital in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and he's a member of the Palliative Care and Quality of Life Research Group, who's been studying and publishing on the impact of palliative care on Brazilian patients. Our format for today will be two parts. Dr. Paiva will lead a discussion on his team's work, and at the end, we'll have a few minutes for some questions from the audience. And so with that, Carlos, it is an honor to have you here with us, and the stage is yours. Hey, thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Martin for his kindly invitation. And I'd like to say that it's an honor for me to be able to present the results of the APROG application development for you. And I think, let me see, let, yes. I guess the first question is, where am I? I am in the city of Barretos, São Paulo State, Southwest Brazil. Barretos is a small city that's famous for two things. Uh, it's the largest rodeo party in Brazil, one of the largest in the world. And the second thing that Barreto is famous, famous in, in Brazil is because of the Barretos Cancer Hospital. It's a tertiary oncology hospital, one of the largest and advanced in Latin America. It's important to, to know that no patient pays for the treatment and is support, supported with government funds and mainly through donations. We see 6,000 patients each day in our hospital. And we have a specific and dedicated unit for palliative care with 50 beds. Okay, to talk about prognosis, I would like to talk a little bit about palliative care. It's well uh, accepted worldwide that palliative care must be integrated earlier in the continuum of cancer care together with other therapies that are intended to prolong life, such as chemotherapy. Early PC has been shown to improve quality of life, depression, and symptom scores. Early PC may increase patient satisfaction with care, caregiver satisfaction with care, facilitate appropriate administration of cancer, anti-cancer therapy, especially during the final months of life. It's well accepted worldwide. But since the importance of palliative care established, is well established, we try to assess how palliative care was performed at our hospital. Now, retrospective analysis, we found that 65% of patients had a PC consultation before death. And the median time from first consultation until death was 2.7 months. Here uh, we can see the graph uh, on the X week, X axis time from first palliative care consultation to death, and the I axis time from diagnosis of advanced disease to death. Thus, categories of potential palliative care referral problems were created and marked with colors. We can see the yellow rectangle, the red, the red parts, the green parts, and the gray part. What is important for us and that is easy to understand, is easy to see, is that the a large number of patients classified in the red categories suggesting the need to refer patients earlier. It's easy to see that in our hospital, we need to improve the, in the referral of patients to palliative care. That's another part of the analysis in, in which we find that patients uh, uh, attend, uh, uh, evaluated, supported, followed by palliative care, had less aggressive care at the end of their life, especially within uh, chemotherapy using in the 30 days of life. Okay, palliative care has a proven benefit. We show in our hospital that's easy to understand. However, how to integrate palliative care in a more timely manner? What we are been trying to do here in Barretos, 
to improve the integration of palliative care in oncology. First, we developed the palliative care referral tool. We have published it, it's well used in our hospital. We are conducting meetings, case discussions between the oncology department and palliative care department. We have a palliative care mobile team that helps oncology in patient. Uh, we are conducting education of clinical oncology team with basics of palliative care. Our residents in oncology, surgery, radiation therapy, rotates in palliative care unit. We are conducting some studies to reduce stigmatization of palliative care. That's very common uh, in Brazil. And another thing that we find very important is a way to prognosticate our patients. The way uh, we prognosticate mainly uh, interfere with the referral rates. So we are conducting some studies to improve prognostication of our patients. Let's see, it's important to conceptualize that uh, when we have an advanced cancer patient, that there are some variables that are very prognostic in the early stage of disease. For example, TNM stage, type of cancer, histopathology, molecular findings, it's very important, but a long time this important, this importance uh, reduce and the importance of other factors uh, uh, improves. For example, ECOG, PS, cancer symptoms and inflammation. We need to take this, this figure in mind. So let's go on. Uh, the accuracy, one question that we have is, how is the accuracy of clinical prediction of survival at our hospital? So we investigated here 35 oncologists who prognosticated 262 patients at time intervals. The oncologists got only 32% of cases correctly, regardless of being residents or tenured physicians. And these results pointed to the need to use a prognostic tool and not only the clinician prediction of survival in clinical practice. I'm showing you some, some findings from some systematic reviews. And as a whole, the clinician prediction of survival is often inaccurate and tends to be too optimistic. It's very common for the oncologist to see a patient say, oh, let's try another treatment. I think he, he will improve with the chemo. Let's try another. But in the intention to improve the patient, many times we are doing so such aggressive treatments at the end of life. This is uh, another way to show the results from one of the systematic reviews. And it's easy to see in this graph that the majority of these studies shows that oncologists, the clinicians, are are overly optimistic. So um, here in general, the clinician can prognosticate using a very traditional way in medicine that is his best clinical estimate. Okay, in addition, the clinician can use other information to improve the estimation. For example, functional scales, some cancer symptoms, dyspnea, anorexia, and so on some nutritional aspects like cachexia, some lab tests, some, some of them are very important like albumin, white blood count, lymphocytes and so on. But uh, some models have been created grouping together several prognostic variables. But what everyone's, everyone wants is a tool that is simple, easy to use, objective, with good discrimination and calibration properties. So considering that palliative care is beneficial and should be integrated early in oncology, that oncologists often overestimate prognosis and that the most commonly used prognostic tools available were PPI, PEP score, PPS that were developed in patients in the last weeks of life. So we intended to develop a new tool for use in outpatients with cancer in the last year of life. Okay, we, we have included in a prospective study 
adult patients diagnosed with metastatic or locally advanced cancers who referred for the first time to the C. There was a development court and another court for validation. This, after some Cox regression analysis, find this model containing female sex, sex, KPS, albumin, distant metastasis and white blood count. And taking this final model in account, we have created a nomogram that we, we know as Barreto's prognostic nomogram. This is the results of the calibration and discrimination. We can see that the discrimination results are good with uh, area under the rock curve between 74 and 84, a C index of 0.71. The curves are well discriminated with the two. Okay, it's fine. It's uh, an example of the calculation. We for every for every every variable we can have a point, and the summit points, the total points we can uh, trace uh, uh, with using a ruler. We can find the probability of survival in 30, 90, and six months. But there are several limitations with the prognostic nomogram. The first is time to complete because we need to stop the consultation using a ruler, sum the points. It's not so easy to do in clinical practice. Although it's interesting, it's not useful, in my opinion. It's not so useful, uh, at least in a, in, a, in a day with so many patients. The other limitation is the use of KPS and not ECOGPS, because ECOGPS is simple and is commonly used by the oncologists. And another limitation is the metastasis category of only two options, yes or no. So take into account the Barretts prognostic nomogram, we try to develop, develop it, a new application improving the Barretts prognostic nomogram. We conducted the reanalysis of data in court one, discriminating metastasis category, changing ECOGPS to e KPS for a COGPS and updating survival data and conducted another validation with calibration discrimination analysis. Okay, we selected the best statistical model uh, and find that Cox regression and log logistical statistical models were the best ones. Uh, eight different models, we find eight prognostic models one with metastasis in the lab test, the other with no metastasis in the lab test, with metastasis in no lab test, and so on. And I will not uh, detail this. Det I will not detail this this part of analysis, just statistics. But we find two different models: a final model, a full model, and a clinical model. We wanted a clinical model to be used in clinical practice without lab tests. The variables are very similar. The difference is that in the full model, we have white blood count and seroalbumin, and in clinical model, antineoplastic treatment, yes or no. This is the validation results, a good C index, a good RL under the curve rock, the calibration, okay, that's perfect. Let's see what I found is most, most interesting. Let's see a clinical case. For example, a female, 60 years, 68 years old, with breast cancer, a triple negative disease, with locally advanced cancer and metastasis of to the bone and liver, that we tried first line with docetaxel chemotherapy plus zoledronato. The patient uh, had a disease progression at liver and local. We tried second line with a doxorubicin-based regime with stable disease. After three months of follow-up without chemo, chemo not another disease progression in the liver, bone, and lung. And we tried third line chemotherapy with capecitabine for four cycles with another disease progression at liver and local. Patient had ECOG PS2 had loss of 5% of body weight, was, had a pain on methadone, and had, among all their lab tests, she had a white blood count of 2,300 and albumin of three. Patient focused on religiosity 
It's very, very common in Brazil. She believes that she can be cured with a new treatment, demands to receive more treatment. Family try to help the decision process, but they have little information. And what we think is most important is the shared decision making, using all the information to decide to continue to stop a new treatment. And in this case, probably, information about prognosis will help the patient to decide together with the physician and the family. If we put this case in the APROG, uh, the first screen, we put the information about sex, presence of local regional disease, ECOG PS, if ongoing or not, anti-cancer therapy, white blood count and albumin, and click next. The next screen, the sites of metastasis, and then we calculate prognosis. The APROG had only three screens. It's very simple to use. In the last screen, the probability of being alive in 19 days, 27%, only 27%. And in a typical scenario, patient had 28 to 112 days. So this information probably helps the physicians to decide, in my opinion, not to continue treatment. But that's that's not a, a final decision. It's only more information in the decision process. We conducted another uh, analysis of another court of patients, recently not published yet, but we presented as, at a poster in, in Nesmo this year. We have another analysis in 255 patients, and we found that in 65% of the cases, uh, we got correct the time using the expected scenario, the typical scenarios. Using the worst to the best scenarios, we got it correct in 92% of the case. And so continuing, what is what I find it important to, to highlight here that we can estimate the prognosis of patients with advanced cancer in, some, in several ways. One is signs of impending death. Patients that are in the last days of life. Here I put a reference that I think is very interesting to be, to be detailed, not for this moment. The another way is the clinician predictors of prediction of survival using temporal, the survival question, and probabilistic, and models uh, like scores and nomograms. These are some examples of models of prognostic models. Some are very famous like PEP scores and PPI, Pronopol, uh, the Spanish prognostic nomogram and the MGPS that I like very, very much, the MGPS together with ECOGPS. I put here a group in two, two sets of models. In the last weeks we can use, well, the PPI, the, the, the PEP score, PPS, and so on. In the last months, we can use other tools. For example, the APROG. Here is easy for you to understand what I'm trying to show. Uh, in the last year of life, we can use some tools with good uh, properties like MGPS, APROG, the Barreto's Prognostic Nomogram, and the Protopol. These tools were developed to be used in the last year of life. We can differentiate in good risk, intermediate, and poor risk. But patients with poor risk in few weeks to months of survival, it's better to use other tools like the PPS, PEP score, and so on. So we have to take this, in my opinion, to take this, this information in mind and look to the patient and see what is the patient that I wanting to prognosticate. There are some strengths and some limitations of a prog. Strengths, that's easy to use app, available for free, available in Android and iOS, works offline, that's not save data, and it has some information about security and ethical issues. The results is in probability and estimated time scenarios, and we have Portuguese and English versions. Limitations, only usable in outpatients, only in solid tumors, not tested on specific tumors. The development and validation sample include patients receiving uh, 
a few patients receiving new therapies, for example, immunotherapy, and should be used only in patients in their last year of life. This is how to download the, the APROG. We can go to Apple Store or uh, how do I say, uh, Google Store, I, I, I forgot. And find, you can type the APROG and install, download. This is the icon that we, we see on the screen of your smartphone. It's very simple. And what for me is very important to, to think about the future perspective. We have three major perspectives with the APROG. First of all, we think about to create new versions or to test the APROG in specific cohorts of tumors. The second perspective is to investigate how the use of the app can change medical practice. For me, it's very important. And the third one is how to use the app and how to communicate to patients or family caregivers the results of the app. So we are conducting other analysis, other studies here to investigate this, this, these things here. And in conclusion, there are several available prognostic tools, models, scores, nomogram, the, the APROG app. The tools are probably have probably similar accuracy, around 70 to 8 percent. There is no, no uh, standard tool to prognosticate. The choice of the best way to prognosticate depends on the patient, mainly where is the patient in the continuing of cancer care. A prog is just another tool that can be used in, is, in my opinion, is well validated. But what I think is very important, in my opinion, is that getting the timing correctly with maximum accuracy is very important, but probably the best prognostic tool should be used where the result is easy to interpret and can assist in the decision-making process. Mm -hmm. Even if it's not very accurate, the tool can be very useful. And I believe that APROG is an accurate, as accurate as the others. That's no problem, but with more potential for practical applicability than the other tools available. It's only my opinion. And I would like to highlight two phrases that I think is very interesting. Uh, that medicine is a science of uncertainty and an art of probability. And the other, it's, it's far better to foresee even without certainty that then do not foresee at all. And with some, I would like to acknowledge some, some partners in this study from our group in Brazil, Professor Bianca Paiva and Daniel Preto, from MD Anderson, Dr. David Hui and Eduardo Bruera, and the hospital where I live. And again, I'm very happy and honored to be presenting you my results of the APROG. Thank you so much, Dr. Paiva. Um, I feel like I learned a tremendous amount. Um, uh, I want to make a comment, ask you a question, and then I see that Steve has his hand raised and he'll go next. So one, I really enjoy hearing that you guys in Brazil struggle with a lot of the same things that we do. We struggle with stigmatization. We struggle with prognostic accuracy. We struggle with navigating religion and miracles. And it's, it's nice to see that we all face similar challenges. Um, my question for you, is how do you help or how do you, have you found a way to get this tool into the oncologist's hands? How do you help them to start using this? Yes, um, I think here in our hospital, we have disseminate and educate about the use of TAP in the routine care. But we find that it's not useful in any case just in specific case. Sure. So it's very, it's very important to have in, in hand this, this, app, this app to use in specific situation. Mainly for every 100 patients uh, when to uh, needing to decide about treatment, maybe the physician will be using 5% of the case, 10% mm. of the case. Mm. But in my routine press, I use frequently to talk about to talk with the family, 
more than with the patient, but families mm -hmm. are, are very time don't know about the prognosis, have a, a very optimistic uh, perception of curability and survival, and sometimes they change completely uh, after seeing these results because it's graphic. And I say, mm -hmm. it's not only my opinion, it's statistics. So, sure. so help some, some way in my practice. Thank you. Steve. Hi, Dr. Arnapaiva. I'm Steve Rommelfanger. I'm a medical director for Aurora's Palliative Program, but uh, nice really interesting discussion. Thank you. Uh, I read through your paper as well. So as we learn more about integrating palliative care successfully into oncology practice, um, one of the things that impresses me about how oncology uh, programs are built is there's so much uh, clinical pathways that are set up. There are a lot of decision-making support tools. I think our system was using or is using via oncology, but do you see a, a how long into the future before we have a tool like yours integrated into clinical decision support pathways that oncologists routinely use? I don't know I, if, if I understand correctly your question, but I, I agree with you. We have so many uh, pathways and tools to use in, in Prezi. Uh, I think it's not, easy to, to, to select the best one and to decide which you use in, in, each, in each situation. But here in Brazil, we have some, some, some different problems. I think the, the great problems may be similar as Dr. Martin addresses, but here we have a, a big problem that is we, we don't have a, 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 how do I say, advanced directives, Planejamento uh, Antecipado Cuidados, Advanced Care Planning. We did use, up to now, Advanced Care Planning in our routine. So that's a great problem for us because many times patients received so much treatment and they didn't think about anything about the disease, the curse of the disease. So we are changing, changing these this, this situations now in the hospital, starting to integrate using advanced care plan. So we don't have here so, so much pathways. We are creating new ones. So maybe we are in another situation comparing with you in the United States. I don't know if I understand your question exactly, but if you could com uh, complement sure. the... Yes, of course. Um, I think uh, advanced care planning is certainly an important aspect of palliative care that we want to integrate. But I also uh, observe that oncologists make decisions about which treatments to prescribe based on decision support tools. Um, that uh, there's, uh, it seems there's all, of, I want, don't want to say artificial intelligence, but it does seem like there is a lot of uh, guidelines that are built into standardizing an oncology practice. And I wonder if a tool like yours would some uh, in the future perhaps be integrated into the decision-making that oncologists use. Does yes, I, yes, yes. I, I agree with you that artificial intelligence will come to help us in some decisions. And just a, a curiosity, we are studying, we are trying to, to create a new tool here to help the physician, to help the oncologists uh, in the shared decision making with the patient, because at least in my routine, it's difficult to to take all this information. And we have much the majority of our patients are less educated, so it's I think it's even difficult to talk with patients that don't have so background about health literacy and to decide about the new treatment. So we are trying to, to create a new tool to help our patients in this, in this process. I don't know, but I, I think can help. And APROG is part of this tool. I think we could include the results together with the two. Thank you very much. All right. We're just about at time at 30 minutes. We appreciate you being here with us. We we learned a tremendous amount and thank you so much. Again, it, it was an honor having you today. Very good. Thank you very much. 
and, and hope to to meet you in person in some time United States maybe or in Brazil you are invited that would be lovely okay. <laughs> all right Carlos see you later bye bye, bye. see you later